Today on the podcast, the best show's Tom Sharpling narrates a chapter novelized by Uncle Grandpa's Kelsey Abbott, plus an interview with Ryan Barton. It's The Novelizers. Welcome to The Novelizers, a show where we make hilarious audiobooks based on your favorite films, with each scene written by a different TV comedy writer and narrated by a different celebrity. This season, we're novelizing the cyberpunk classic, The Matrix. Hi, I'm Christine Bullen here with Kevin Carter and Steven Levinson. Kevin, what's going on in the story so far? So Neo is at work at this boring job, and then he receives a phone in like a FedEx package, and it so happens to ring. It's Morpheus, and he guides Neo out through the cubicles before he's captured by the agents. So he thought. Neo got up to the top of the building, got outside, and he was like, you know what? Fuck this. And he chose to be captured. Thanks, Kevin. So every day, all the time, nonstop, I get text messages from friends and families and loved ones and complete strangers, and they're just constantly asking me um, how they can support this podcast that they love so much. Steven, what the hell should I tell them? It's a fabulous question. And you should tell them that we've got a Patreon account, and just for $1 a month, and that's less than a pack of their favorite smokes, they can keep this crazy train on the tracks all year long. Every dollar goes straight into production, and it really helps. And we can't do it without them. And they can leave us a good review on their favorite podcast app. That's awesome. I will tell them exactly that verbatim. Today's chapter was novelized by Kelsey Abbott, who has written and performed on dozens of your favorite animated shows like 12 Forever and Uncle Grandpa, and narrated by the host of The Best Show and producer of What We Do in the Shadows, Difficult People, and Monk, and co-host of the podcast Double Threat, Tom Sharpling. Tom Sharpling novelize us the matrix chapter four friends or foes novelized by kelsey abbott narrated by tom sharpling neo sits at a table in an empty white room this is where those nasty suit wearing agents brought him after stealing him from work he wonders out loud where the heck am i that's right he talks out loud to himself occasionally and he's not embarrassed to do so not only did his therapist tell him it was okay but he's also handsome and cool. When you're handsome and cool, you don't get embarrassed. He does, however, still get nervous. And right now, oh boy, is he damn nervous. Nervous because those nasty, slick-haired agents threw him in this white room, and he has no idea why. Neo continues thinking out loud. Maybe I don't have to be nervous. I mean, I don't really know if those agents are nasty. What if they're good guys? Neo smiles. He loves thinking critically through tough questions like this. Okay, so they could be bad because they're hanging out with cops. Oink, oink. But not all cops are bad. Die Hard, for example. He's a decent dude. Neo's smile fades. This is getting complicated. But Die Hard was a pretend cop, and those cops are real. And they shot three dogs on the way here. But maybe, just maybe, those dogs were criminal dogs. Like maybe they had rabies and were biting off the faces of elderly people? So the question still remains, are the agents bad boys or good guys? Neo's thinking real hard. He's looking up like he's trying to see into his brain. His brow is furrowed and he's tapping his finger on his chin. If anyone saw him at this moment, they would immediately know he's thinking real hard. Oh wait, Morpheus straight up told me these agents are bad boys. Problem with that is, I don't even really know Morpheus. We only talked on the phone for like a minute. He could be a liar, liar, pants on fire. Neo's getting antsy. He's even more confused than before. Also, he's been locked in this little room for hours now. He looks down at his bare wrist as though he's wearing a watch. Where are they? What the hell is happening? I got shit to do today. You might be thinking, what the hell could Neo possibly have to do today? Well, smartass, he has to get to the store to use a coupon for a free chicken breast before it expires. He has to brush his teeth at some point. And most importantly, he has to call his cousin Fingley and wish him happy birthday. Last year, he forgot and Fingley was so hurt that he broke his sobriety of six years and crashed his PT cruiser into a historic tree. 
Neo can't let that happen again. Not only would Fingley probably go to prison, but Aunt Sippy, Fingley's mother, would get so sad. And when Aunt Sippy is sad, she's unable to perform her job as head surgeon at the children's hospital, and a lot of children will die. Finally, the door opens and the agents enter. Agent Smith sits across from Neo. He's wearing sunglasses even though they're inside and the room doesn't even have windows. Neo thinks wearing sunglasses inside a windowless room is super rude, and to express his feelings, he growls, <laughs> Agent Smith ignores the growling. He knows Neo won't bite, and he slaps a thick manila envelope down on the table. The name on the file? Anderson, Thomas A. Neo reaches for the file, but Agent Smith slaps his hand away. No touchy. Neo growls again. <sighs> but it says my name. Agent Smith tells Neo, just because something has your name on it, that doesn't mean it's yours. This is our thick file about you that we were able to make because, spoiler alert, we've been watching you for a long time. Neo's like, spoiler alert? Agent Smith nods and opens the file. He flips through the pages while making little comments. Hmm. Uh-huh. Ooh, that's embarrassing. Neo can't take it. What's it say? What's it say? It says you've been living not one life, but two life. I mean lives. Fuck. Agent Smith is so frustrated he has to growl himself. Urgh. This gets Neo growling again. Grrr. They continue growling louder and louder over one another until the other agent, who's just been standing in the corner like a creep, claps his hands. This breaks up the growl match, and Agent Smith continues. In one life, you are Thomas A. Anderson, program writer for a respectable software company. You have a social security number. You feed the rats outside your apartment building, and when your neighbors ask you to please stop, you tell them it's a free country, and you start singing the Star Spangled Banner. But you don't know the words to the Star Spangled Banner, do you, Mr. Anderson? I know enough. Neo holds his hand toward the agent in the corner. He wants a high five. The agent in the corner wants to reciprocate, but he's hesitant. Agent Smith would probably get mad at him. Neo keeps his hand up. Don't leave me hanging. The other agent looks away. His sunglasses can't hide the tears rolling down his cheeks, and he's ashamed. Neo finally puts down his hand. Whatever. Your loss. Take it away, Agent Smith. Oh, I'll take it away. When I'm ready, which is right now. So your other life is lived in computers where you go by the hacker alias Neo. Neo smiles. Hell yeah, I'm so cool. You may be cool, but you're also guilty. Guilty of virtually every computer crime we have a law for, which is like three crimes. Neo crosses his arms and frowns. Get to the point, will you? Oh, I'll get to the point. We need your help. We know Morpheus called you, and we know he's got the voice of a nice guy, but he's really a bad boy. And in this business, we call really bad boys terrorists. That's right. Your best friend Morpheus is a terrorist. Neo interrupts. He's not my best friend, but maybe someday. Neo smiles. My best friend Morpheus. It's got a nice ring to it, don't you think? Stop smiling. Morpheus is considered the most dangerous man alive. Does that sound like best friend material? Now do you want to be like Rocky and or Bullwinkle and do the right thing and help us? Or do you want to be like Boris and or Natasha and not help us, which would be the bad thing? Neo gives Agent Smith a good hard stare. How do I know you're not like Boris and or Natasha? Smith doesn't like the question. Not one bit. What the fuck? Did you seriously just ask me that? I am nothing like those Potsylvanian pieces of shit. He knows Boris and Natasha are from the fictional country of Potsylvania because he's a huge fan of the Rocky and Bullwinkle show. But Neo's not convinced. Why should I believe you? You could just be lying to me. Agent Smith takes off his sunglasses and Neo is floored by how absolutely gorgeous his eyes are. Agent Smith bats his eyelashes. I'm not lying to you, Thomas A. Anderson. I'm calling you by that name instead of Neo because if you help us, we'll forget Neo exists. Your dirty record will be wiped clean. Don't you want that? Don't you want a fresh start? Neo's heard all he needs to hear. These agents definitely suck. They're bad boys to the bone. He loves being Neo. A real good guy would never want him to give that life up. You know what I want, Agent Smith? Agent Smith is hopeful. A fresh start? 
Wrong. I want my phone call. Agent Smith angrily puts back on his sunglasses. Why, you little? I may not know how to tie a shoe or shoot a pool ball, but I do know my rights. I want my phone call. I'm going to use it to call my cousin Fingley and wish him a happy birthday. And then I'm going to have him do a three-way call so I can talk to my lawyer while it's still being technically one phone call. Very clever, Neo. But how are you going to tell your cousin happy birthday? Neo thinks this is a stupid question. Uh, by calling him and talking to him using my mouth to make words? Agent Smith smiles, which is weird. He should be mad, right? What mouth? You don't have a mouth. What? Oh, shit. Neo begins to feel the muscles in his jaw tighten. He panics as he feels his lips grow all sticky and slowly seal shut, melding into each other all gross-out-like until his mouth is completely gone. Neo is freaked the fuck out, rightfully so, and he lunges for the door, but the agents restrain him. Inside Neo's head, he's screaming. He wants to scream out loud, but his mouth is gone. He. <laughs> what the fuck? What the fuck? How the hell did they make my mouth disappear? This sucks. I hate breathing through my nose. And I'll never get to sing karaoke again. Oh, fuck. I won't be able to wish Cousin Fingley happy birthday. Smith nods and the other two agents pin Neo to the table, ripping open his shirt. Man, today really sucks for Neo. He lost his mouth and his favorite shirt. Agent Smith is feeling really cocky now. You're going to help us whether you want to or not. Neo is still struggling. His mind is still racing. I knew these agents were bad. It took me a little bit to get to that conclusion, but I got there and I was right. These guys fucking suck. They do suck, don't they? I hate them. Agent Smith reaches into his suit coat and pulls out a bag of gummy worms. Neo spots the bag and if he had a mouth, it would be watering. He loves gummy worms. Oh my god, yummy. I love gummy worms. Then it dawns on him. Wait, I can't eat that gummy worm without a mouth. I can't eat anything without a mouth. Oh man, that's a big problem. Smith moves in closer and pulls out a gummy worm, holding it over Neo's bare belly. The gummy worm begins moving on its own, transforming into an organic creature. Neo struggles even harder, his eyes locked on the scary yet still tasty looking living gummy worm. Shit, the gummy worm came to life. The gummy is straining, trying to get closer to Neo. Without warning, Smith drops the gummy worm onto Neo, and somehow that little fucker burrows into his stomach. One of the agents holding Neo down, the one who couldn't give him a high five before, mouths, I'm so sorry, to Neo. Agent Smith sees him and shakes his head. Don't be sorry. It's his fault. Agent Smith then leans towards Neo's ear. By the way, I fucking love Boris and Natasha. Thanks, Tom. Of course, every week on the show, we also interview someone who worked on the actual film, The Matrix. Let's hear that interview. Today, we are interviewing Ryan Barton, who was the assistant to the Kung Fu choreographer on the film. Ryan, how are you doing today? Hi, I'm doing really good. I'm so excited to talk about my experience on the film. Yeah, we're so excited to talk to you. So the assistant to the Kung Fu choreographer, can you uh, explain a little bit of that to us? Yeah, so, you know, The Matrix, it's a very extensive um, um, and fight heavy action movie, you know, and also the choreography, might I say, incredibly beautiful. Um, so I was the assistant to the choreographer and I was basically not only in charge of helping with the actual choreography process, but that this also includes choosing weapons, how, you know, what styles are we going to switch from? Um, also, I just want to be super clear I do not have a crush on Keanu Reeves. I do not. Oh. Um, and yeah, I would say those are like our my main um, couple goals while I was on set. And that's so interesting that you say that about um, Keanu because I, I, I wonder why you felt the need to express that here. There's, there's really no implication that you would have had a crush on him. Mm, yeah, and I hear you, Christine. I hear you. I just think it's really important for me to, because, you know, rumor on sets, rumors are like flies. And yeah. um, I just want to say that, you know, this one was going around 
around. And again, I don't have a crush on him, but like, like, can I, can I say that like he is an attractive man? You absolutely can. There's no one that's going to, um, you know, refute you on that. He's, he's quite an attractive person. And in this movie, I mean, like the role he's playing is just a naturally. I just, it's like one of those things where, you know, when you are teaching someone choreography, you're very close with them. Right. Yes. Like, yeah. Physically, you're, you're you're touching his body. I assume. Right. Yes. I'm touching his body. I'm getting hit by him. You know. You have to like wait sometimes for camera, and you're just left to sit there and like look at each other's eyes. So he would look into your eyes when the camera wasn't rolling. It's just he's just cute. You know, he's just got this way of like looking into your soul a little bit. But I'm a professional. In no way, shape, or form would I ever pursue that or have a crush on him so just to get a little more into the the mechanics of this so you were the assistant to the choreographer and who was the choreographer yeah the choreographer um was yen Wu ping um he's actually okay. super famous um Fun. i actually it's so funny how he even got the job but yeah um, tell me about it honestly i was at a coffee shop in la this is so stupid back in god whenever we shot this and I was like working on my own script and I was like, we were at a Starbucks and I was getting one of my favorite drinks. Not, not the, um, just, I, I'm just like a hot chocolate guy. I can't drink coffee. So I was whipped like, cream or, or no whipped cream? Oh, whipped cream. Absolutely. Caramel drizzle too. If you got it. Do they give you marshmallows at Starbucks? No, you have to bring them yourself. Yeah. No, we just, we literally ordered the same thing, you know, hot chocolate for Yen Wu Ping. And I went up cause I just assumed it was for me. Um, and we both kind of like went, you know, we like touched each other's hand and I was like, oh my God. And he was like, oh, this is fine, I think. And, you know, one thing led to another. And then all of a sudden I am assisting choreography on The Matrix. That's so interesting that he picked you just from a, a casual hand brush at Starbucks. Did you have any experience whatsoever in choreography up to that point? I understand that like I may not have come in with like as much like extensive like research as someone who is maybe like, you know, training in a dojo. But I think Uh what a lot of people don't expect in the movie industry is personality goes a long way. But I I was like, hey, we're really getting along. What are you working on? He asked me what I'm working on. You know, we played that fun little L.A. game. And what were you working on at the time? I was working on a really fun um, train script. Train script? Yeah. Like it's just it all takes place on a train. And it's it's just like kind of silly, kind of fun, kind of comedy. Um, but I, I I told him a little bit about that, but I could tell that's not really his, you know, ammo. And like again, this is like a fun romantic comedy. He tried to make it an action film. And I was like, that's kind of like that what I'm going for. And this is really cool. He said, "You've got potential." Oh, that is such an important thing to hear in Hollywood. It, you know, mm-hmm. and we all have our story of someone important telling us in a Starbucks after we order the same thing, "Hey, you've got potential." So he asks you to join him on the movie, which is already underway, I'm assuming, at that point. Here's the thing. When you have a literal kung fu master, like Yan Mm -hmm. Wu Ping, like he is the top dog in all of Hollywood, right? Everyone goes to him. Yeah. You kind of don't need to plan. And, And what I mean by that is it's not like we would just go in and be like, hey, let's throw this at the wall, see if it sticks. It's like he is so good that you you just like watch him kind of coordinate, right? He'll go through the choreography and be like, okay, yeah. this feels good, this feels good, da 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 he, it's, it's all movement. It's up to me to memorize that movement and to give it to the actors. Um, but, you yeah. know, it's like he just kind of creates it. It's like artwork. It's like a brush stroke. And then from there, uh, it's up to me to kind of put it in a language that the actors can understand and get them up to speed. So you're taking the choreography that Yen has come up with and then you are then translating it in some sort of physical way to the actors on set on the day? It's like he, let's say, for example, he does a punch into a roundhouse kick. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I can imagine. A lot of actors have no idea what that means. So when I'm on set, I just break it down for them. I'm like, okay, everyone, get your little fisty, push it forward, do a little turny, and keep the leg out. Mm-hmm. Strike high, strike mm-hmm. high. And like that's my way of being like, we are punching and going into a roundhouse kick. Yeah. When you are kind of like this kung fu master, you kind of don't like he he doesn't really want to deal with the actors that much. You know, like actors are a lot. The, the yeah. things I would hear, like just on a day to day basis, it's like me, 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 me. And I'm like, oh, I totally understand him not wanting to like dabble in the Hollywood of it all, you know? Yeah. So 
What was your favorite moment on the Matrix? Um, I remember it was May. It was a really beautiful day. Um, and we were shooting and it was a very, it was a very closed, like intimate set. And um, that day, like smaller, smaller crew. And yeah, I don't know. I think like after we were done, I got the quickest little kiss on the cheek um, from Kay. And he told me, and I'll never forget this, hey, you've got potential. And when it came from him, it felt different. You know, it felt different this time. It was like, I've always believed it. But that time I really yeah. believed it, if that makes sense. When these people say to you, you've got potential, do you have an idea for yourself what they're referring to? I think they're referring to this part of me that is so talented, but my motivation doesn't let me reach it. Got it. So like you don't, you like want to do things, but you don't do them. Yeah, like I have the talent for it. But when it comes to like the actual doing of it, I get kind of like, uh, I don't know. You know, I think what was both good and bad is Keanu telling me that it was so sweet. It, it was so sweet, but also, you know, a little heartbreaking because again, we're just friends and there was like really nothing more there than just platonic energy. But him saying that was both great and confusing. Yeah, I think there are those um, there's those things that people say to you in your life and then they sort of just kind of play on repeat in your head for years. And it sounds like this might be one that's been on repeat for 20 years, even though you've heard it from other people hearing it from him. And it sounds like in a somewhat intimate whisper on the last moment on set. I imagine you have conflicting feelings about that. Yeah, it's like listening to your favorite song. It's always good. And sometimes you lose the energy of it, you know, because you listen to it so many times. Um, but yeah, I definitely hear that over and over again. Some would say haunting, but I kind of just, I'm trying to do my best to be at peace. And something in me tells me like when I finish this train script, get it sold, get it made. Oh, so you're still working on writing it. I am almost done with act three. And, you know, it's just gone through so many rewrites. And, you know, when you rewrite something, you got to take it apart. Right. So it's yeah. always being worked on and it, it's always finished. Right. I mean, I guess it, it, like, yeah, I, I guess it does actually have to be finish though at some point in order like to tell it or get it made right you know here's the thing about creativity and art christine what you, what you're okay. telling me that feels like a box i choose to live in the box where things are very free flowing i choose to live okay. in a box that is duality is it there is it not there it doesn't matter because it's all true right so when i type the end in my script it's not really the end because I know I'm I'm going to go back in there and delete some stuff and move some stuff around and then I'll be rebuilding. Yeah, it's so interesting because when you say this, it sounds like, you know, you could interpret this as like someone who just like can't really finish something or like maybe doesn't have the sort of like motivation to do anything. But like what I'm really getting from you, Ryan, is that you're like so super motivated and like kind of living on a different plane so that like the end wouldn't make sense because it's kind of just the beginning, you know? Wow. The end won't make sense because it's kind of just the beginning. That is beautiful. Well, I, I really appreciate you for helping me find that. And you know that it's just another thing that I, I'm good at. I'm just really good at people. You know what, Ryan? I cannot tell you how much I've appreciated this interview. I'm so glad that I know you. And I just want to say something, and I, I hope this doesn't come off the wrong way, but you've got potential. Christine, thank you so much for saying that. I can feel the tears starting. You are the fourth person to tell me in my life, and I am going to wait till the fifth one to do something about it. I think that's a really good move. Ryan, thank you so much for being with us today and um, we'll see you on the other side. Thank you so much, Christine. That's our show for today. Join us next time for a special crossover episode with the Sleep With Me podcast. Stephen, go ahead and unplug us from the Matrix. You got it. Thanks to today's guests, Kelsey Abbott, Tom Sharpling, and Ryan Barton. Novelizers is produced by me, Stephen Levinson, with Graham Douglas, Kevin Carter, Christine Bowen, Dennis DeClaudio, Rob Kuttner, and Suchatis Bokeel. Music by Cole Emhoff, art direction by Crystal Dennis. Theme song by Andrew Lynn, performed by Knotts. Special thanks to Wiseo Radio in Yellow Springs, Ohio. The Novelizers is a work of unauthorized parody. 
Follow The Novelizers on Instagram, Threads, Facebook, and TikTok. And please donate to our Patreon. Write to us at thenovelizers at gmail.com. Copyright 2024, Novelizers, LLC. Take us out, Amy Mann. There was a matrix made of computers. There was a guy who could dodge all of the bullets. He lived in fluid, just like a fetus. But he was born again like baby Jesus. Novelize that movie. Write a book and also read it.